Well, thank you very much. Um, my firm is currently engaged in an investigation. We've been instructed by the Financial Conduct Authority, and we're investigating the conduct of a fund manager in one of the smarter parts of West London. Uh, they are a, uh, a long-only fund, but uh, have a number of uh, very high net worth uh, clients. The investigation is into their trading practices, not in a market abuse kind of sense, but actually in the manner in which they've been executing trades and in which they have been paying for research. What is interesting about this investigation is it's not occurring in the context of MIFID II. All of the activity predated MIFID II. But it highlights the issues that this regime is designed to deal with. And so I'm going to try and dip into those anecdotes. We've also been advising a lot of clients on MIFID II generally, but certainly on research and unbundling. Our clients are predominantly asset managers or buy side. And at the initial stages of the MIFID II implementation project planning, this item, was highlighted as the most strategically significant of all of the others. For the main reason that most of the large asset managers are international organizations. If you're going to offer up research on U.S. equity markets, you tend to go to a U.S. analyst for that, not to somebody sitting in London or Paris or Frankfurt. And the issue of how that research could be paid for within the rules became a very important one. And indeed, what we've seen in practice is this issue being big and, and something now that has now been addressed unusually by the Commission directly working in conjunction with the Securities and Exchanges Commission of the United States. So something that I'll also, also touch upon. I think this context is important because for a lot of sell-side uh, bankers, less so the brokers, they say, what, what, what really is the issue here? And hopefully I will try and unpack uh, that issue in the context of this rather technical uh, subject. Um, but what I'm going to do firstly is just to talk a bit about what actually constitutes investment research. Why is it important? Why does it matter? Uh, also talk about the, man the times when I can pay for it without constituting research. Uh, and I realize there's a session tomorrow on inducements. This does link a bit into that. Um, and then the very practical point of how the process actually works. People may be surprised to see lawyers actually talking through flowcharts, but in this area it becomes very important because so much of this is about operations, about governance, about justifying this to your clients, to the law firm investigating you when it goes wrong, and ultimately to your regulator, and certainly what is coming out of the investigation we're doing. Um, and then the question about how valuation of research is documented, what about disclosures, and finally this question of delegates, particularly overseas delegation. But firstly, to set the scene, in addition to the scene set that I've already done, um, source of obligations. Very simply, there is a basic, rather thin obligation in the MIFID II directive itself. Uh, very importantly, the, uh, the delegated directive um, has a lot of material. That's the same delegated directive that deals, for example, with the protection of client money, also with product governance, on which there's another session and then the ESMA Q&A. And ESMA Q&A a are a very valuable source of guidance, and one uh, which, which certainly our clients look to. We read it in conjunction with the guidance uh, given by the Financial Conduct Authority, and note that this issue has been a hot issue in the United Kingdom for many, many years. It cuts to the heart of the manner in which business is done in the city and the West End between the sell-side brokers and the buy-side asset managers. Um, and then actually under the member state rules. COBS uh, is the acronym for the UK Conduct of Business Rules that go into a lot of detail and also not so much gold plate, but create some very important guidance, particularly around the status of the account. And it's a rather technical point, which I'll come on to, to touch on. But one of the key issues, and I was advising a client literally last week on this, has to do with the manner in which the money is protected. The protection of client money, one of the most um, controversial issues, particularly in the wake of the failure of Lehman Brothers, and an issue on which the UK Supreme Court has actually given some very useful judgment, including how you interpret directives 
um, in United Kingdom law, which at least for the time being is an important uh, factor. Um, but certainly the manner in which money is protected and held in account becomes important. Very technical point, but often the point where firms will be, be caught out. But as I say, all of that rolled up in, in, those, in those rules. So to those of you um, in other member states, bear in mind that here we are looking at member state rules, not at a, a level two uh, e directly applicable EU regulation. So the detail may, may differ. But the governing principle, and, and I want to stress this, because again, in our investigation, this is what comes up, and this is what this really strikes to the heart of. When paying for third-party services such as investment research, use your client's money with the same standards of care as you would if it were your own money. And this also cuts to a very important concern amongst lawmakers and policymakers, not just in the United Kingdom, but in the world over. This basic question of how, with all of us living longer and longer, are we going to afford to pay for our retirement, particularly when they are very low interest yields. And what certainly is happening in the UK is that the financial regulator that now has a competition objective is targeting third party costs. So it's saying to fund managers, the reason that your clients aren't getting the returns they deserve is because you're paying too much in the way of fees. And in this case, when you look at the question around research, is around transparency. So this is a very important theme. And what we're seeing in this investigation, what we're scrutinizing, is the extent to which the manager is documenting the process for paying for research, thinking about how that picture is, and asking the basic question, are you getting value for money for your client? Now, interestingly, they're come back to say, this is rubbish. We've given our clients double-digit returns. We are very, very clever people, and we made our clients lots of money and they come back to us, and they like working with us. And you say, that's a good point. But the fact is that if you had only paid away, let's say, 3% um, in management fees and fees to third parties, um, and, and, and say not paid away 5%, that extra 2%, using your great skills and brains of investment, would have meant that your clients would have got even better returns. And that's a very important context to place, because I think it, it places this whole rather dry area in context, and it's really what it cuts to. Um, in terms of, of who this, this affects, and I think there's an important point here. Firstly, it arises as a general exception to, or a particular exception to the, the, the general inducement rules, um, again, which, which uh, there'll be uh, a talk on tomorrow. Um, and so, as we all know, you cannot take an inducement However, third-party research is not an inducement if it is received. And the received piece is important because this regime does not apply directly to the sell-side brokers, but rather to the buy-side users or consumers of research. Um, and there, there are two basic manners in which that can be done. It's a direct research, a direct payment from, the, from the, the manager's own funds using their own P&L, or using a research payment account. And this is really what we're going to unpack and, and talk about. So as I said, it focuses on the users, the buy-side users. However, we also have sell-side broker clients. And we had a lot of questions that they came to us about saying, how does this change for us? To which the short answer was, you need to be mindful of what your buy-side clients are going to have to do. So you need to start pricing research if they have to pay for it. Uh, you need to be very um, uh, careful about how you disseminate certain pieces of information, which might be research, because your buy side might say, please don't send us those emails, because we're not, we're, not we're not paying for it, and therefore we can't receive it. Um, interestingly, of course, ultimately, what a lot of this comes down to is commercial negotiation. So, for example, we prepared research agreements for the sell side to give to the buy side. The buy side just came back and said, no, no, this is the way we want to do it, and, and things have worked out that way. Um, but as I say, it, 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 is, it, it, is, it is more of my side. The only final point, though, is that um, the sell side can't give away research for free. And a very interesting question, practically, that arose is that where, whereas um, sell side brokers said, well, we've never had to price research before because it was simply included in the price of execution. So we're now going to price it. And actually, for those of our clients who are going to pay for this using their own resources, they may find it was a lot less than it was when we weren't pricing it.
But the risk you run there is that the regulator turns around and says, well, hang on. Why is it that in the past you were not too worried about how much you charged and you charged a high level, but now you're charging a low level? And so you can have a, a result that actually you have a retrospective investigation, much the same as I'm involved in now, because the research wasn't properly thought through before. And it's one of the interesting parts about MIFID II. A lot of the MIFID II projects we do actually shine a light on the fact a lot of our clients didn't comply with MIFID I in the first place. Um, but, uh, but this is, as I say, is, is an important point. This is really buy side focused, but does have this impact on the sell side. And in terms of the issue is, is, is set out um, there, if you really break it all down. First question, is it an inducement? No, you can retain, yes. But, but as I say, if you, if you run through this decision tree, there's this first question then of whether it's research or market commentary, we'll come and talk about it. If it's a minor non-monetary benefit, um, you can then retain it, you don't have to worry about the, the research rules. If either it is research, you then have these two ways you can go. So this slide essentially sets, uh, sets the point. But as I say, just, just re-emphasizing the point on the rule, it is not an inducement if received in return for direct payments or a, a controlled uh, payment account. In terms now of what we mean by investment research, and again, if you take a step back, investment research as a concept received a lot of attention in 2001, 2002. I don't know if many of you either remember it or have read about it. The dot, uh, the dot com bubble, bur uh, bubble and then the bubble burst, where there were allegations where these very star analysts, mostly at Wall Street investment banks, had publicly been saying that um, certain tech companies were a gri great buy, but privately had been making some very rude comments about them. And a very particularly notorious individual is a gentleman by the name of Henry Blodgett, who was actually banned uh, from the industry. He's then gone on to become a very uh, successful consultant and speaker. Um, but he uh, would, would go in the morning on CBS and make all these, uh, you know, give, give his tips on, on, on particular businesses. But there were private emails um, where some, I won't repeat the language, it was rather rude. Um, but the acronym POS, uh, to refer to something as a piece of, um, about the very same company. So the focus on research, and that was very much on the sell side providers of research, and hence all the rules, um, some in MIFID, but also others under actually the market abuse regulation about conflicts of interest in research. And that, again, when we talk to the sell side, is very much the focus. But the question that arises simply is whether a particular piece of, of analysis or information, a, piece, a particular email put out, is actually research, and certainly we've had a lot of, this time, the sell side clients saying, can we send this email to our, our, buy, our buy side clients? Um, and so you have to take a step back. Now, the first point is the research uh, the, itself has to relate to financial instruments or, or other assets. It's got to be clear that it's going to inform some type of, of investment decision, um, or else the issuers of those um, or else closely related to a specific industry sector. Very interesting questions around fixed income, bonds, because bonds are very different things uh, to, to shares in the terms of the way they're traded, um, and even one of the big questions actually about the way research was paid, that whereas research in equity world is, is paid as a percentage of the trading commissions, in bonds it is taken as, a, as part of the interest spread. And so the, the challenge for the that the, the, the bond, uh, uh, the, the, those trading bonds, has been a lot greater around investment research than it has been for, uh, for equities. But also the whole question around that often with, with bonds which are more concerned about credit, is a piece of macroeconomic research about, say, the economy going to be relevant? Because if the economy is bad, there's a good chance, or say a better chance, that a particular issue is going to default. Is that research for these, for these purposes? And again, I think one would still then really jump into the second bit of the analysis. And this is where um, I think the biggest part of, of setting the analysis that we have to do comes in. It talks about substantiated opinion. So if you have something that is very learned and, and worth paying for, as we'll come on to talk, becomes quite important, is clearly, clearly research. But what about something that that's doesn't quite meet that standard? Because I'm saying this is presented as research, and actually it's gone through the protocol under, uh, under, under the other uh, investor protections under the market abuse regulation. Um, and somebody is proud to put that out, and under the new world it's been clearly paid for. But the question is where you have something less at. A typical piece of market commentary. I mean, the same way that we as lawyers will send, you know, weekly, sometimes daily emails out to our clients telling about stuff that we think is important in the hope they'll then pick up a phone to us. Um, so it's the same with a lot of our sell side clients. We'll say we're going to sell good ideas to the buy side, et cetera. 
and where do you draw uh, this line? And really, if you cut through all of that, that last concept there of, of adding value becomes very important. Um, and sometimes you almost say back to the sell side, uh, the client says, well, do you, do you think this is, are you proud of this piece of work that you've got? Oh, yes, very much so. Did you do a lot of work with it? Yes, completely. He said, well, then more likely than not, it's going to, you know, it's, it's going to constitute research. Um, but it is a very broad definition. I think the other also idea of it, it either being explicit or sometimes implicitly recommending is one that also tends to, um, t tends to trip people up. I mean, one practical question that, that, that we've had lately is people saying that, look, what we do is we take a collection of comments made by other commentators. We maybe take you know, sections out of the FT and, 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 and the Wall Street Journal and we bundle them into an email and send them off to a client. Is that research? And I think our, our view is, well, although you're adding value, you probably aren't enhancing what's actually being said in terms of analysis. And so we think you're, you're, you're on, on the line where you're, you're okay to do it. But it's a fine line to tread. And, and people come to us and say, we want a policy on this. We said, rather train up the brokers to, to recognize it um, so that they know where they're starting. Line. And again, just coming back, and I know I'm I seem like contradicting myself as I'm focusing on the buy side, but the whole point of the social of sell side is it then makes it easier for the buy side recipient to take it without having to, to worry that they may be, may, may be running foul. So as I say, there is that definitional issue and, 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 and it really does often come down to looking at things on a case-by-case on, on case, uh, basis. And then in terms of the question of, of what, what a firm is allowed to receive without it, uh, constitutes it, you, you get into the question of minor non-managed benefits and again, I, I don't want to steal others thunder from tomorrow. But in terms of where this becomes relevant on, on the sorts of questions around um, items of information that have been sent, there are these points that are, that are set out. Short-term market commentary, um, brief unstabbed summary of the third party's opinion on information, very much coming back to what I was talking about earlier. You know, it, it, it does that. So you, you are able probably to, to turn around and say, actually, by definition, this is not research. And what's more, um, you're going to fall into the, into the minor non-monetary non benefit. But again, it is a question of, um, of, of having to analyze it. And, and very often the sell side uh, might say, well, the buy side often say, we don't want to receive it if it's not actually going to add value because we were busy people and we, we've got better things to read. Um, but I think it is important in terms of that tree that you still will, will have something to consider. But we really get into the, in, into the guts of, of, of the, the presentation and, and, and talking about what if it is research? And here there are essentially two options have been given. The lawmaker said that, look, um, if you don't want to have to go through the rigor of the, 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 the payment account, the transparency process, then pay for it yourself. And in the London market, the majority of buy side managers are beginning to do that. As I said, it's just a lot less hassle. And actually, some others, when we were having early conversations, said, well, shouldn't we really be paying for this ourselves? I say, we, we as lawyers, uh, you know, we have to pay for our own law reports. I mean, at one, at, in some stages, some were saying, well, can we offer different levels of service to our clients? Can we actually say that, that you know, we'll give you service one whereby we're not going to rely on research, and service two, we will rely on research? And you said, well, that's untenable, because, the f first of all, a lot of people say, well, we're just, we, 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 why should we come to you if you, you're, you're only going to... Um, you know, you're not going to rely on everything at your disposal. And then other people said, well, actually, we don't use research anyway because it's all rubbish. Um, we just make, make our own decisions. So there, there were a lot of questions internally about just how much research should be consumed. But the idea, coming back to this point about treating your client's money as if it is your own, when people have to pay out of their own resources, there's a lot more focus. You know, uh, I think a lot of uh, managers are also under, under, under cost pressure at the moment. Um, and the other thing, too, though, that has to be considered, of course, is the, the prudential context. And this is where we, we focus predominantly on, on conduct risk, but the idea that if we're going to pay for ourselves, can we actually afford to pay for it, and, and have, we, have we factored that into? Um, and also the proper, uh, the, the, you know, the proper costing, of, the costing of it, because, and this comes back to my point about if actually the sell side, if we say go to the sell side and say it's too expensive, it's too expensive, it's too expensive, at what point do we beat the price down so low that actually we're now receiving an inducement from the sell side, particularly if they're also offering other, other bundle breaks. And there's, and there's a commercial tension there. So people say, well, this is, this is rubbish. We, we, we should be able to, to knock the price down when we negotiate on ourselves, and, and obviously we're going to try and knock it down when negotiating on behalf of our clients. 
But that's what I'm going to say about the own resources point. Not as straightforward as people thought, however. There still has to be a process around it. But the real um, innovation, if that's the right term, on the MIFTU is this idea of the research payment account. And again, a lot of people say, gosh, that all sounds dreadfully dull. Um, but actually, as we unpack the mechanics, you'll see why this begins to shine a light on the whole process of the consumption of research. One important point, this term account. <clears throat> I mentioned the issue around the protection of client money earlier. And again, this is an area of huge focus, particularly in the UK after Lehman Brothers, and a big part of my practice. But the idea of the account, and I know the ESMO, there's ESMO Q and analysis, which, which differs slightly around the status, is not necessarily the idea that, let's say, at, at the beginning of Q1, the client pays his or its, its portion of money into the research payment account, which will then essentially be credited to the broker. Rather, it's an accounting mechanism so that the money stays with the client. Let's say the fund, the manager declares a mandate over the money, and the money is only credited to uh, the account when there's a debit from the broker, so when actually a piece of broker research arises. And if that is the way it's working, the question of having to protect that money as client money, put in a separate account, have all the systems around that, doesn't arise. We've had a lot of discussion, quite a controversy over this with, with, with a particular client. And certainly what the, the FCA rule does is envisage this. If, however, you say, no, we're going to do something and, and, and there, they, there, there, are, there is a mechanism of paying for broker services, something called a commission sharing arrangement, a CSA, and a lot of people asked, will those still be allowed? Because the idea of the CSA was that the money was paid into there and essentially the brokers took money out, some was rebated back to clients. But the idea there was that the money had already been paid into the account. And, and, and where we are currently in debate with a particular client, we're saying you can't use CSA money taken before MIFID II came into effect. Not because it's not allowed, because actually there was a, the, the MIFID contemplates that you could pay from a CSA into uh, a research payment account, but because you're not protecting his client money. Now, again, I apologize, this is all directly technical stuff, but in practice, this is really often where the, where the focus comes. Um, however, turning on to the, going, going to the actual um, uh, account itself, if I can get there with a the slide. Which I do. Um, yeah, this is called the research maze. And as I say, don't be, be very surprised when a lawyer can actually put together something that isn't just uh, bullets. But essentially, this sets out the, 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 the process as, as, a, as a schematic. Um, I'm not going to dwell on all these slides too long, but legally, or from a compliance perspective, there are important, a couple of important touch points. Um, the first is going to be the client agreement, because the research charge has to be agreed with the client. The second is going to be the operational oversight of the research payment account. Um, how has it been operated? There may be questions about it being outsourced. The other question is the research quality policy. Um, and I'll start unpacking all of these, these concepts as we go through, uh, go through the, 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 the flow. The first question really is, is just the costing of research. Now, we've been talking about the idea that the research has to add value. But this question of the buy side, again, having to treat their client's money as if it was their own, comes in here, whereby they actually have to make an assessment. The way uh, a lot of the buy side clients do it is they'll actually rate research and give weightings. They will take soundings from the various managers to say, why do you like a particular broker? If they say, because he takes me to the rugby match every Saturday, and you say, no, 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 you can't do that anymore. You actually have to start thinking about the quality and being able to assess that and justify it. The governance around this becomes very important. So there's this question first year around actually determining the cost of the research. The question then of whether we can, we, 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 we can, uh, we can pay for it. And this ties back to the question of, of uh, the, the research uh, quality. It will also then tie back into the question of how much do we want to pay. And the question of how much we want to pay is multifaceted. First of all, to what extent do we as managers actually think we need research? If somebody says we're very bright, we do our own research, it adds nothing. Question whether you should be using it, bearing in mind it's your client's money, that you, and, and always has been in the past, that you're using to to pay. And then around that is going to be this idea of having then to agree the, the research budget with the client. And this comes back to the question of how much is the client willing to pay. And in a sense now, the managers almost have to justify the client. Look, a lot of the client's institutional investors, they'll understand. It's the insurance companies, the pension funds, they'll say, 
we choose to use the research provided by XYZ Bank or independent research house because actually it's high quality. They've got some very bright people on the staff and they, they've actually, they, they know the companies very well, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to enhance the, the job. So there has to be this, uh, the agreement up front. And the question then is how do we operationalize this? And this is what has come through in this investigation that we're doing. What oversight is, is, is there, um, particularly around issues of how things are paid, how it's audited? Um, are we outsourcing the operation of the account? A lot of the administrators, actually some, are, including some of the, the depositors, like, are actually offering this as a function. Questions around even MIFID to outsourcing become important here. What about the oversight of, of the outsourcing and reporting to clients? Another big piece has been how this was disclosed in fund prospectuses. Um, so actually this wasn't a MIFID question, it became a usage question, making sure we're saying the right things. And this operationally, and sorry this is a rather practical aside, was also resulted in certain holdups because the Financial Conduct Authority, um, as the authority approved under the usage directive to approve changes to prospectuses, had to actually approve changes that were made by, 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 R, by RPAs uh, there. Um, so the question then of really valuing and, and documenting uh, research, um, as I say, these are points that I've already touched on, but the key thing here is this reasonable assessment of the client's best interests based on, on quality. We've also talked about the, the inducement. Um, actually, it, 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 if, if it's too good, we must be careful that we're not paying too little for it. It's a rather odd concept, and there's a contradiction here. Because on the one hand, we need to be negotiating hard on our client's behalf. But if we beat the sell-side brokers down so low, because actually they're getting a nice chunk of business on the side through trade execution, where they make the real money, that can be viewed as an inducement. So it's, and again, one's between a rock and a hard place, likely. Um, and then the question also that making sure that the, the charge actually pays for the research. And there are interesting questions. I mean, an interesting practical question that came up for a number of our clients. They said, um, we have 100 clients, institutional investors. 40 of those have said to us, we're not paying for research. Why should we? We pay you a management fee. You pay for the research. Other 60 said they will pay. What do we do? Is it the case that you can only pay for research from one source? And, and Esmo made a claim, no. You, you actually you, you can pay for research using your own source and using it. But then how do you penalize the clients who haven't paid for the research? Because they're going to be benefiting from it. And then the other question around, you know, there's a question of cross-subsidization, fairness, treating all your, your investors equally. Why should it be that those who have said, no, we'll, we'll, we'll pay for it, are now essentially carrying those investors who don't? And our clients still grapple with these issues. They, they, haven't, they haven't necessarily come to them. Some have just actually said, to hell with it, we're just going to pay for it all ourselves because it's a lot easier. Um, although, not them secretly at the same time put up the management fee. And that's another area that there has been scrutiny of. And I think this is an area that the regulators could possibly look at. When they say, we see that you decided to pay for it yourself, thank you very much. But why is it that you've in increased your management fee by an amount that just happens to correspond very closely with the amount that you're going to be paying for research? Um, and that, that is a, there's a serious point there, I think, that is, that is going, to be, going, going to be looked. And then the other thing about really is, is the clear audit trail. And I come back to this investigation we're doing where no management information was given to the board about how services were paid for. An interesting aspect of MIFID too, I think one that gets overlooked, is the impact on governance. And certainly in the, in, 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 in the United Kingdom market, and this all flows from the banking crisis and, and everyone else has got caught up in it. In this investigation that we're doing, in compliance speak they talk about a first line, a second line, and a third line of defense. The first line is the front office who actually ought to understand the regulation themselves such that they pick things up. The second line is compliance. You know the compliance function. They should educate the first line and then also be the experts that monitor and pick up. And the third line is internal audit, who should check up on the other two. But in addition to that, the mandate we had was look at what the board was doing. Look at the governance around this. And in so many of these investor protection topics, even some of these other topics, the role of governance becomes very important. And the, the, the quality of information that goes to the board is only as good as the information that comes through these, these, um, these audit trails and, and, and what have you. And certainly uh, in, in, in our regulatory environment, one that's been scrutinized. 
Um, what is interesting, this is an aside, is we, we are looking with interest from in the UK at, at the ECB's new governance regime model quite closely, it would appear on the senior manager regime. And certainly look now, a, the head of a bank was, was, was banned just two days ago in, in the UK. But this idea of governance and this audit trail does become very important. I can't, I can't stress that enough as a practical point. Um, and it runs throughout all of these, these topics. And this in turn also ties back to the question of the, 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 the policy, showing the regularity. When we talk about systems and controls, and I was talking about the term systematic, we talk about something that is done on a repeat basis, that is done consistently, that can therefore be reduced to being put up to information. Um, and also this question around addressing the extent to which research benefits the client's portfolio, asking always, does this actually have a benefit to the client? Are we using their money as if it was our own? And the final point around disclosing that policy to clients. Again, disclosure, big, a big uh, theme, I don't know if it's too, but certainly here with, with research. And in terms of the disclosure, I'm not going to go into to, to detail here, it's on the slide. But essentially, prior written disclosure, talking to clients is not the manager's money, it's the client's money. Um, explaining uh, all of these, 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 uh, these points here. Um, being very clear on the budgets. And the, the law is clear, if you don't spend the entire budget, you give it back to the client, or else you roll it over onto the next, the next year. Um, and and uh, uh, questions around, um, as I say, all the detail on how, how third, party, uh, third parties have been paid. Um, there are other also uh, disclosure requirements around execution, um, but being very clear that there has to be a, 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 a dis uh, unbundling, a, a, a no connection between the volumes of execution and the research. And interestingly, again, coming back to this investigation we're doing, the questions we're asking is, what is the correlation between the research you've been getting and the trade execution that um, you've been giving the person that you, you're giving the, that? And that's been the key, the key question. Um, and I say this is the entire thing that this, this process is, is, um, is designed to, to combat. Now, the final topic, and a vitally important one in practice, indeed vitally important beyond research. Um, as I said at the outset, when these rules were put out, for our large fund manager clients, they were the most, potentially the most damaging and disrupting, costly of all of these. Because research is not determined or sourced on a national basis, it is international. These businesses are international. And the whole question around if you have a, 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 a common set of operating processes, how do you program those processes in a way which ensures that you're complying with the MIFID II requirements? And bear in mind, you know, we, we don't just set out that maze because we're trying to look smart. These are complex processes. Um, you know, the, the typical run of the, of, of the MIFID II project that we've been involved in is to get the rules interpretations, to get a, an agreed position, and then to get the operations, the technical people, to actually program this into the systems test those systems, hopefully in time, the deadline, implement, and then test. But where you're running a universal system, somebody says, where's your trading decision made? It's, we don't know. We can trade equities anywhere. We, so we can sit, I can set a screen, I can sit on the beach in the Bahamas, and I can trade on a market. My court. And so these questions became very important. And the, and, and the key question here, if we, we to think about a, a typical fund structure, Let's say, for example, that you have a Luxembourg fund, you have a, a management company, whether that's in AFIM or Usitz Manco, also in Luxembourg, but they delegate the portfolio management, the actual thinking, the decision making, to someone, uh, not necessarily in the EU, but perhaps across to Boston or to New York or out to Hong Kong. Um, and a lot of the agreements we look at really go to the whole question of that if we outsource or delegate this function, how do we ensure that we comply with MIFID II generally? And bear in mind that we can't delegate or contract out of our own MIFID II obligations. And actually, I'm, ta I'm taking a pause back um, here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a bit too much like a UK lawyer because our financial conduct authority and their wisdom gold-plated MIFID II and applied it to the USIT managers and the AFINs, particularly these research requirements. Currently, uh, happily, well, not yet, AF and D2 and USIT 6 are coming, and it's quite likely that these provisions will, will apply there. Um, but the, the basic principle, certainly if you were, say, a, a MIFID portfolio manager, to be absolutely clear, when we talk about the distinction, it's a very simple one. 
Uh, if all of us pull our money together, give it back to manage, that is a collective investment undertaking. If, however, each of us enter into a separate uh, management agreement, then that is method portfolio management. That, that's essentially the, 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 the difference in very crude terms. Um, but there are the differences. We were saying that in the one case, you're subject to method, and in the one case, actually also subject to all sorts of, all sorts of restrictions. But the typical model would be that you would have the AFM or the USIPS manager delegating that out. And so there's a question, there was a question always of, well, we, we have to make sure that we can abide by our duties. One of the most controversial ones is best execution. And it was taken as a given that, look, we're satisfied that the SEC best execution rules and the fiduciary principle will mean that we, in turn, are, don't, don't run foul of our best execution duties here. Slightly more difficult when you're going to emerging markets. Um, and sometimes there we've actually, within the agreement, will you'll say to the emerging market uh, portfolio manager, you have to comply with these requirements. And we want best result. Best, ex best execution always seems to be the most difficult one. But a lot of the others, it's, it's much the same. But research caused a real, uh, a real problem. Um, and the, 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 the real problem, which I'll go back before I, I, I get this, was simply this. In the United States, you cannot pay for research using hard dollars because of a concern about uh, the broker in question having actually to register as a, as a manager in order to, hire, to, to manage the money. It's, it's, a, it's, it's quite an abstruse point. Now, some people said, well, that's easy. Those US brokers, they want to deal with Europeans, they must re-register. And people said this, this is a, a real problem. Um, because the idea was that if I have to ensure that my delegate is actually complying with, with MIFID II, this is going to be a problem for them. Now, taking a step back, the FCA in the UK put out a very unhelpful response to a question where they said, we think the duties travel. A few of us, as one of the trade associations, said there's no basis in European Union law for this. Go and look at Article 31 of the, or Article 30 of the MIFID organizational regulation, most important MIFID II regulation, organizational regulation, which actually talks about the delegation of functions to portfolio managers. Mirrors very much what's in the AIFMD. It says nothing about those functions having to travel. So we said to the FCA, there's no basis in European Union law for your decision. To which they turned around and said, so what? If we think that these obligations travel, there's nothing to stop us doing that. Again, we disagreed. You said, well, I don't think I understand how an EU directly applicable regulation works. Because one of the paradoxes of an EU directly regulation is it constrains national regulators a lot of the time. Um, so the upshot of it was that there was, there, there was this, this issue that, that, that arose. Um, ha happily and helpfully, the Commission published a, a number of frequently asked questions on non-EU broker research. And they simply said that we will allow bundled research, and, and it does refer specifically to the US, but we, we, we interpret it read more broadly, provided there are certain requirements that can be satisfied. And again, they're all out there. But I mean, the issue was that even if you bundle it, you've still got to be able to attribute it, to identify it, to do a lot of the things that you would be doing with the research payment account. At the same time, you know, a great example of international cooperation, uh, the US Securities and Exchanges Commission also sent a so-called no action letter to their broker saying, we're happy for you to receive this in this way without that, that posing a, a, an issue. The practical impact on all of this really still comes back down to the order, but it, uh, the, the caption of, of being audited and the question of documentation. I've gone quite long um, and said a, a lot. I'm very happy to take any, any questions. As I say, this is, a, this is a, 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 a relatively technical area, very important to the buy side, but perhaps of more passing interest to the sell side, although I think they became a lot more focused on it, um, you know, certainly in the run-up to MIFID, MIFID II. Um, and one that still, uh, still uh, causes uh, problems and concerns. Any questions, or, or are you a bit shell-shocked? Oh, gosh. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, yes. 